What's going on my fellow rock and rollers? Now some of the most memorable bands of the early 90s alternative rock movement were collaborations between members of some of the biggest bands at the time. And the ones that really come to mind include Temple of the Dog with their self-titled record, and of course today's topic, Mad Season, with their lone record, Above. And like a lot of bands to come out of Seattle, Drugs played an important role in the history of the band, not just in its formation, but in stopping the band in its tracks. Now the formation of Mad Season really began with Pearl Jam's third record, Vitalogy. And during the making of the album, Pearl Jam guitarist Mike McCready was struggling with alcohol and substance abuse and would head out to Minnesota to go to rehab. It was there in rehab that he would meet walkabouts bassist and fellow Seattle resident John Baker Saunders. And following their treatment, the pair agreed to start a band together to help them both remain sober. And they would seek out Screaming Trees drummer Barrett Martin to start writing material. And all the band needed now was a singer, so McCready would reach out to Alice in Chains frontman Lane Staley, who was deep in the throes of heroin addiction. Now McCready was hoping that the trio would have a positive influence on Staley and help him get clean. And 1994 had been a disastrous year for Alice in Chains as the band started off the year releasing their hugely successful EP Jar of Flies, and the band was supposed to tour that summer with Metallica, but addiction and infighting forced the band to split up for about six months. And with lots of time on his hands, Staley agreed to front Mad Season. Now at that point in Lane Staley's life, he was living with a roommate named Johnny, and the members of Mad Season would drop by Lane's place and discuss the band and have him listen to instrumental tracks that the trio had come up with. Now Lane's roommate would recall in the book The Untold Story of Alice in Chains how Lane and John Baker Saunders didn't exactly get off to a good start as Saunders used to come over to Lane's place and fall asleep on his couch. Lane would take guitarist Mike McCready aside and tell him that Saunders couldn't keep coming over and falling asleep at his place because then Lane would have to tiptoe around his apartment. Now that one little misstep aside, the band would get together several times to jam, and based on the great chemistry, the group had booked their first gig. Now the band would play their first show at the Crocodile Cafe in October of 1994, and most of the songs played at their first gig would end up on Mad Season's Above album, but they also threw in a cover of Jimi Hendrix's Voodoo Child. Now since the band didn't have a name yet, by the time their first gig rolled around, they called themselves the Gacy Bunch, named after the serial killer John Wayne Gacy. Now it would be guitarist Mike McCready who would suggest the band record a demo, but it was Lane Staley who raised the stakes by suggesting the group record an album instead. Now the group knew they had to come up with a legitimate name though, and McCready would look back at Pearl Jam's first record 10, which was mixed in Surrey, England. Um. The name of Mad Season originated, and I won't go too deeply into it, but when we were mixing the first record, the Pearl Jam record in Surrey, England, the, the people that worked at the studio said, oh, it must be the Mad Season, they, and that's the season when all the hallucinogenic mushrooms come up oh. over in Surrey, England, and I thought, ah, I'm going to uh -huh. keep that title for something someday. Now the band would head to Seattle's Bad Animal Studios to record with producer Sam Hofstede, and Hofstede would remember the recording of the album saying, Lane was still working on his lyrics and vocal parts when it came to actually recording the album. He would go into the studio by himself and have no one else around him and he could operate the tape machine and do a little bit of experimentation without feeling like anybody was listening to him or watching him. So Brett Ellison who worked with Pearl Jam also worked with Mad Season in the studio and also recalled Lane's drug use at the time saying Lane was not healthy. Heavy, heavy drug use. Such a sweet guy and such an amazing talent. We were in cahoots with his roommate who would get Lane off the couch and point him in our direction. And Lane would show up and he'd go back to the bathroom and he'd be doing dope back there and he'd wait for hours before he was ready to come out. He was pretty open about it. I asked him, why are you doing this to yourself? And he said, I'm either going to drink or do dope and drinking is harder on me, he'd say. Now the band would spend two weeks in the studio with Staley writing all the lyrics focusing on similar topics found on Alice in Chains' records. Lane was heavily into reading at the time, and his personal favorite was a group of 1923 philosophical essays titled The Prophet. And the book is even referenced in the song River of Deceit on the record. And in 2002, drummer Barrett Martin described Lane's headspace at the time, saying, Lane felt like he was on a spiritual mission with his music. Not a rock mission, but a spiritual one. And in the end, Above would be a very blues-influenced album, more in line with Pearl Jam sound, and less like what Alice in Chains were doing. Now, two successful singles would be spawned off the record, including River of Deceit and I Don't Know Anything. And the album would finally be released in March of 1995 and would be certified gold by June. 
Now in early 1995, the band would play a series of shows with the final performance of the band taking place on April 29th, 1995 at the Moore Theater. Now members of Alice in Chains and their production staff were in attendance as Lane was already back with Alice in Chains at the time, working on their self-titled record. Now that performance at the Moore would be released years later, and according to John Baker Saunders' brother, the band was at one point in talks with Saturday Night Live to perform on the show, but unfortunately nothing would happen. So what was Jerry Cantrell's feelings on the supergroup? It's about the music, you know, and I, th I think early on, you know, in a band's career, like uh, you had mentioned previously, and, uh, you know, I can use experiences from my own band as well, and, you know, the other guys get a little jealous if you do something outside, and myself included, you know, like when Lane did, uh, Lane did the, uh, uh, the, uh, the record he did with Mad Season and McCready, you know, I was a little pissed about that myself, you know, it's like, I don't know, if you, if you spend so much time together in, in a non-sexual way, it's like somebody fucking your girlfriend, you know, <laughs> basically. You know what I mean? You've got this relationship with them, you feel a little betrayed, you know. And, but <clears throat> as you grow a little bit and, and maybe a couple of days pass and you think about it a little bit, I mean, I, that's, that can only be healthy, you know. And I think, I think that, that uh, they've dealt with that issue and, and, uh, and that's a good, good thing to see, you know. I think they cop to it too. For all that jamming and for all that exploration, he's a better player. And when you yeah, come back to the doubt. fold, it's that much cheaper. Without a doubt, I mean, bring, whatever, whatever you, wherever you go on a trip, man. I mean, you're going to bring that back to the group, you know. Uh, you know whether that is used within the group or whatever. Uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly where that's going to come out. Whether you're a better player or you got some different ideas or whatever, or you just feel better because you did it, you know. And you come back with a clean slate, you know, whatever. I think you know you got to, you got to. Uh, being in a band is a really tough thing, you know, I mean, uh, it, it's it's a really bizarre balance, you know, of like these four or five really strong personalities and and really creative people and, and uh, you know, if, uh, you know if, if most of the material is coming from one, one angle a lot, uh, you know, even if that's what you're known, known as, you know, I mean, that can be a little stifling, I imagine, you know. Uh, and in my case, you know, I mean, I, I, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of the stuff that I've written played with Alice, you know, and, and, and then doing this thing. But uh, I, th I think, uh, you know, Lane doing that record was a thing for, for him as well. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a very, very cool thing to do. You know. Now, two years after the above album came out, there were rumblings in 1997 that Mad Season was going to reconvene to write a follow-up record. Now it's important to note that at this point in time it looked like Alice in Chains seemed to be done as Lane Staley still hadn't kicked his addiction and his health had only gotten worse. In the book Everybody Loves Our Town, The Oral History of Grunge, it was rumored that the second Mad Season album was going to be called Disinformation. And drummer Barrett Martin would tell author Mark Yarm, we started making a second record for Mad Season. We had 16 or 17 songs we were working on. We were going to do the same thing, have Lane be the main singer and lyric writer and have Mark Lanigan of the Screaming Trees be involved, but I could never get either of them to come to the studio. And then Mike McCready had an idea to do a band called Disinformation. I guess Lanigan was going to be the singer, but again he never showed up. So what happened to all the studio time the band had booked? So according to drummer Barrett Martin, the band divided the studio time amongst the different members who would go on to do their own projects. Now one band member of Mad Season who was eager to get the band back together was bassist John Baker Saunders. So in the book Everybody Loves Our Town, they talk about his demise and how he was the first member of the band to pass away due to a drug overdose. Now one of his friends was interviewed in the book and recalled, I was in Baker's house probably a week and a half before he died in 1998. He lived in a tiny house in a suburb of Seattle and was really sad that they weren't finishing Mad Season's second record and he was stressing financially as well. He was just really somber. And when he first came out of rehab and I met him, he was extremely excited because it was a fresh start. And in the same book, author Mark Yarm would speak to another friend of Baker who shed some more light on his life around this time and described how Baker had recently got into a relationship with a woman from Belgium who had gone back home and he was feeling really lonely. Baker would end up relapsing and would end up overdosing when his dealer was over at his house. But his dealer waited a while to call 911 and by the time the paramedics got to him, he was dead. And one of the last people Baker talked to was drummer Barrett Martin who was supposed to meet him the next day over lunch to catch up since they hadn't seen each other in a while. Now with Baker gone, Mad Season's future seemed more in doubt as Lane Staley revealed in a 1999 interview with Rockline. 
The members of Alice in Chains were promoting their Nothing Safe box set when a caller called into the show to ask Lane about Mad Season. And here's what he had to say. Dude, hey, I got a question for Lane. Yeah. Hey, what's going on? I was wondering, um, do you have any more Mad Season in the works? And if so, are you guys going to do any like, small club dates or anything like that across the United States? No. No. <laughs> uh, ah, double no. We're not, we're not uh, doing anything more. Uh, actually, uh, the bass player uh, passed on this last year. So. Yeah, right. Yeah. Baker. Baker, yeah. So um, nothing in the works for Mad Season. Yeah. Fast forward now almost 13 years, and Mike McCready would reveal that he was looking into bringing back Mad Season with a new singer, and he would reveal how he wanted to re-release the Above album, along with the More Theater show, in addition to several unreleased tracks. Now, the unreleased tracks dated back to the aborted second Mad Season record, and the eventual release box set would come out almost 18 years after the original release of the Above record, but that wasn't where the band's story ends. In 2015, the band teamed up with Guns N' Roses bassist Duff McKagan, Soundgarden vocalist Chris Cornell, and the Seattle Symphony Orchestra to do a one-off performance. The performance would be released, and the album debuted at number four on the Billboard Top Classical Crossovers album chart. In the same year, Barrett Martin revealed he was writing new Mad Season material with Mike McCready, as well as Duff McKagan, and that project would eventually morph into The Levee Walkers, which would release several songs over the subsequent years. So that concludes today's video guys, thanks for watching, let me know your thoughts in the comment section below, and as always if you have suggestions for future topics let me know them as well, and be sure to hit the like button and subscribe, and if you guys want to support my channel, simply watch another video or go check us out on Patreon. Take care.